In order to obtain the estimates of beta0 and beta1, we need to set them to values such that this expression here, the sum of the square of the residuals, is minimized. So another way to understand this is that we can define a function, let's call that function s, and it's a function in terms of a and b, so a and b are the two variables. And this function is defined in such a way. So minus a minus b times xi squared. And then we want to find the values of a and b such that this expression here is minimized. So let's say for a equal to a0 and for b equal to b0, so a0 and b0 are some constants. So let's say for this, for these two particular values, this function here is minimized. So once we find the values a0 and b0, we can then set the estimate of beta0 to be equal to a0, and then we can set the estimate of beta1 to be equal to the value of b0. And since a0 and b0 are values that minimizes this function, we will know that by setting the estimates to be equal to these two values, uh, these two estimates will then be values such that this expression here is minimized, which is what we want. So in order to find a0 and b0, we're going to have to consider the partial derivative of s with respect to a, and then we set this to be equal to 0, and then we need to find the partial derivative of s with respect to b, and then we need to set this to be equal to 0. So a0 and b0 will be two numbers such that this condition here is satisfied. So we need to consider these two conditions, and then from these two conditions we derive the value of a0 and b0, which will be values which cause the, these two conditions to be satisfied. So once we find a0 and b0, we can then set the estimates to be equal to a0 and b0. So this is the expression that we're going to focus on in this video. So of course, uh, by considering this expression alone, it isn't actually enough for us to guarantee that the value that we get that satisfies, the value of a and b that we get that satisfies these two conditions will be a minimum point. It could be a maximum point, or it could be a saddle point. Uh, so you need to either graph this function out, or you can check a Hessian matrix to verify that the value that of a and b that you get is indeed a minimum point. So I'm not going to go through that justification in this video. I'm just going to, to assume that we already know that this condition here is already going to give us the minimum point. So we're going to consider this condition in this video to derive the estimates for beta0 and beta1. So now let's first consider the partial derivative of s with respect to a. So we're going to differentiate this function with respect to a. So we're just going to use the chain rule. So we're going to get 2 times yi minus a minus b times xi. And then since we're using the chain rule, we need to differentiate the term on the inside. So we're going to get a negative 1 because we're differentiating the inside term with respect to a. And then we're going to set this to be equal to 0. So of course I can divide both sides by 2 and negative 1 to get, a, to get rid of these terms. And in the end, this is what we have so far. So we have the sum of all the y terms plus n copies of a, uh, minus n copies of a, and then minus b times the sum of all the x terms. And this is going to be equal to 0. And then now I'm going to introduce two terms in order to simplify some of these uh, these symbols over here. So now I'm going to define the sample mean of x, which is equal to the sum of all the x terms divided by n, and the sample mean of y, which is equal to the sum of all the y terms divided by y, divided by n. And then once I've defined this, I can now express this expression over here as n times the sample mean of y. So you see this is uh, much easier to write than having to deal with all the summation signs. So this here is n times the sample mean of x. And of course you can cancel out some of these terms. So you see that a plus b times the sample mean of x is equal to the sample mean of y. So this is one important result that we've obtained so far. So the value of a and b that minimizes this function, now we know that the, for those corresponding values of a and b, it must satisfy this equation. But now you can see that we have two unknowns, but we have one equation only. So now we also need to consider the partial derivative of s with respect to b. So now we consider the partial derivative of s with respect to b. So we differentiate this. So the process is pretty similar to what we just did. So we have yi minus a minus b times xi. And then uh, since we're using the chain rule, we also need to differentiate the inside term. This time it's with respect to b, so we have negative xi equal to 0. 
And of course, I divide both sides by negative 1 and 2 to get rid of these terms. And so now we have, first of all, the sum of xi times yi, and then minus a times the sum of all the x terms. So instead of writing out the summation sign, I'm going to express this as n times the sample mean of x, and then minus b times xi times xi, so b times xi squared. And this will be equal to 0. And this is going to be our second condition. So we know that the values of a and b that minimizes this function will first of all satisfy this first condition. And then now using the partial derivative of b, we've found the second condition. And so now we have two unknowns, a and b, and two equations. So now we can solve for the values of b and a. And then for those two values of a and b, those would be the values that minimizes this function. So in order to do that, first of all, you can see that we can substitute in a as the sample mean of y minus b times the sample mean of x, and then I can just substitute it in this expression. So I have x i y i minus, so a I have sample mean of y minus b times the sample mean of x times n times the sample mean of x, and then minus all these terms here. So now let's open a new page. So now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to group up all the terms with a b attached to them to the right, and then I'm going to leave the rest of the terms on the left-hand side. So that means on the left-hand side, I have the sum of xi times yi. So that's this first term. And then we also have a minus n times sample mean of x times sample mean of y. This is also another term that's, that, that doesn't have a b attached to it. So we've dealt with this term. And now for these two remaining terms, they all have a b attached to them, and then I'm going to shift them to the left. So we have b times the sum of all the x terms squared, so that's this term, and then we also have uh, the sample mean of x squared times n, and then these two negative signs, they give you a plus, so once you dump it to the other side, you get back your minus sign, so we have minus b n times the sample mean of x squared. And so now... I can, of course, pull the b out and then put it outside of a bracket. And then now I can divide this term over to the other side. So we see that b is going to be equal to this expression divided by this term over here. So minus n times the sample mean squared. So essentially, we're done over here. This is the value of b that minimizes the function that minimizes the function s. So this is going to be the b0. b0 is going to be equal to this expression over here. And as we've seen, a is equal to this expression, so we know that a0 is actually just equal to the sample mean of y minus b0 times the sample mean of x. So essentially, we're done over here. So this is the, the formula we have for b0. And then once we find b0, we can immediately derive a0, and these will be the two values which uh, would satisfy these two conditions. So once these two conditions are satisfied, the, this expression, this function here will be minimized. And then we can take these two expressions, and then we can set beta 1 hat to be equal to this expression, and then set beta not hat to be equal to, to this expression. And then if we do that, then this sum of the square of the residuals will be minimized. So these are the two formulas for the estimates of beta 1 and beta naught. So essentially you can say that we're done over here, but there, I'm still not quite satisfied with this expression. So usually when you learn this, uh, this, so this expression here is definitely correct, but usually people prefer to express it in a different, nicer way. So I'm going to show you that as well. So the alternative way to express this result is, first of all, we need to consider the numerator of this expression. So you see that the numerator, we have the sum of xi times yi minus n times the sample means. And then I'm going to rearrange some of these terms. So instead of writing out the sample mean of x, I'm going to re-express this back as a sum. So this is just the sum of all the i terms times the sample mean of y. So now I can combine both of these summation signs. Both of these have a xi to them. So I take this xi, and then we'll have yi minus the sample mean of y. 
And then now I'm going to, to perform a, a trick, sort of. I'm going to minus the sample mean of x and then plus the sample mean of x. So overall, I'm just adding 0, so there's no net effect on the overall term. And then I'm going to group these two. Uh, this entire expression into two different uh, two different components, and then if I do that, and then I expand these brackets, what I'm going to get is first of all, x i minus the sample mean of x times y i minus the sample mean of y. So you see, this is a rather nice looking symmetrical term, and then plus the sum of the sample mean of x times y i minus the sample mean of y. And then this term over here is actually going to be equal to zero. And you can see that because if you sum everything out, you can t first of all take out the x, the sample mean of x. And then here you see that you're summing all the y terms, and then you're summing n copies of the sample mean of y. So if you sum all the y terms, that's just equal to n times the sample mean of y. And then if you're summing the sample mean of y n times, that's just n copies of the sample mean of y. And this is of course equal to zero. So this whole thing here is just equal to zero. So you see the denominator term can actually be expressed in this rather nice looking form. And then you can see that the denominator has the same exact structure as the numerator. And then uh, by the same logic, we can actually also express the denominator in such a way. So the denominator can, be, can also be rearranged into something like this. So you can check this out yourself. You can apply the same method, and then you can see that the denominator is going to turn into something like this. And so once I've rearranged the numerator and the denominator, now I can express our b naught also the which is also the estimate for beta 1 in this alternative nicer looking form. So the formula for the estimate of beta 1 is equal to the sum of xi minus the sample mean of x times yi minus the sample mean of y. And then divided by the sum of, the, of x minus the sample mean of x squared. So this is the formula for the estimate of beta 1. And so the estimate for beta naught, I'm just going to write this out one more time, is just equal to the sample mean of y minus beta 1 hat times the sample mean of x. So these are the two formulas that we're after. And so essentially we're done. We've derived the formula that would allow us to estimate beta naught and beta 1. So in the coming videos, I'm going to show you uh, the properties, the different properties of these two estimators. And then we're going to see that these two estimators will have some really nice properties, which is why we're learning about it anyway in the first place.